Uh, appreciate you coming over and listening to me speak this morning. Get y'all woke up today. We let it tackle this heat. Uh, so as Ali said, I'm over in Pottawatomie County, Shawnee. I cover the Southeast District uh, for agron as an agronomy specialist. Uh, some of you I may have seen at some meetings before. I spent 20 years at Noble as the perennial pasture plant breeder there. Uh, but staying in my home state, I'm originally from Shawnee, so that's where I grew up. And so that's that's where my office is back home. So uh, anyway, so kind of my specialty is what I've worked a lot on is cool season uh, pasture options and you know, even though we're in the heat of summer, it won't leave but a few months before we start thinking about our winter forage programs and what we can do. And when Allie asked me to speak, uh, I thought, well, maybe I'll talk to you guys a little bit about some of the new things you may be seeing out there. You know, there's a lot of things rolled out on the market. Sometimes you see a lot of things about them. They not know a lot about how they're used or how they're planted or, or kind of what they're what their target is. So we'll talk a little bit about that. So I might jump around a little bit, but uh, sometimes it's hard for me to keep up with all these new things that are coming out. Uh, talk a little bit about the cool season forages, the forage quality adaptation, and then kind of what I'll jump into is on our cool season annual grasses. Uh, on our small grains, I'll talk to you a little bit about triticale and oats. And then we'll talk a little bit about the perennial cool season grasses, the summer dormant that you may have heard of versus the summer active, and a little bit of some of these grass and legume mixtures that I've got a lot of questions about because of the price of synthetic fertilizer, which is pretty high. It's been fluctuating a lot, but I think once it's up there now, it's not gonna come down for quite a while. So this is one thing I always show a lot of, a lot of folks is, this is us in the summertime a lot, or it is right now. But you know, why cool season forages? That's us in the wintertime. So there's not a lot of green out there for a lot of folks. So we need to start thinking about our cool season forages. Uh, some of the advantages or why we grow cool season forages. Uh, basically, we're filling forage gaps. You know, if your warm season base is Bermuda grass, you know, what are you going to fill in for those months? Maybe you're planting a winter annual like wheat for graze out, but you still have gaps in that program sometimes. As an agronomist, my goal would be, ultimate goal is get you guys to have grazing 365 days out of the year. So, because every day you put a bell of hay out there, that's money out of your pocket. Uh, so yeah, reducing that hay and feeding supplementation program. Uh, a lot of your cool season forages produce high quality hay. Uh, it's one thing I work a lot with people. It's like, well, they cut a lot of hay, but if you're going to cut hay, let's try to cut some quality hay, cut down on that supplementation program. So if we look at what we got around here, these, and you can kind of think about, you know, this is when I say a forage gap. That's a forage gap. Uh, you have a warm season base, say in the green there, the Bermuda grass, you know, you're going to have forage gaps in the winter. So trying to get to that 365 days of grazing is filling in those gaps with different forages. Uh, looking at our cool season grasses, uh, one thing about them, you know, most people probably don't know that once we fall below 60 degrees Fahrenheit, our growth on our cool season grasses like tall fescue and wheat slows pretty good. Once we get down below 32 degrees of freezing, pretty much stops. You'll see some yellowing a lot of times on these forages. They'll just sit there, they go into a kind of a, a dormant state, but eventually they'll pop out once that temperature gets above freezing, start growing very slowly. That's usually what we see in these months here, going into December, January, early February, and March, uh, is that slow growth. And then we hit peaks like March through May, early fall. Compare that to our warm season grasses. Uh, what we see is warm season grasses have extremely high growth flow rate over a short period of time, where cool season grasses have a much flatter curve. We get a longer growth period over longer months. So here, as you can see that little graph here, we get a very good peak. Warm season grasses, 
really peak out at about 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Day like today, they'll grow pretty good. Then it'll taper off. Once we get above 100, nothing likes to grow. Uh, so it'll kind of start to shut down. But you can see our cool season grasses kind of peak out at about 70 degrees. Once we get above 70, they really start to slow down. Question for you. Yep. When days like this, when it hits 100 degrees, you say it stops growing, but if it cools off at night, it'll grow to 70 to 80. Is it still growing pretty good in yeah. there and the majority of the time? Yeah. So for like Bermuda grass to really grow and optimal, actually grows better at night. So we're about 70 degrees at night in the mid 70s. That's optimal actually yeah. growing conditions for the What about natives? Natives, they can handle more heat. So they'll actually, you know, days like today is fine with those, but you'll get uh, probably more growth during daylight hours or more photosynthetic activity with the natives during yeah. the day than you will with the natives. Uh, Bermuda really likes more humidity, I guess you could say, because yeah. Bermuda grass is tropical in nature. So uh, actually, uh, when I was being trained years ago as a plant breeder, I worked a lot with Glenn Burton, who developed the Bermuda grass. Uh, Glenn was actually, he used to come to my office and talk a lot, and he would tell me things. And you know, he was trained at Rutgers, actually, as an alfalfa. So I asked him, I was like, how'd you get into the, you know, this grass? Business? He's like, well, I'd made some collections over in Africa and stuff, and I had this grass. And he was at Georgia at the time. He said, actually, I kept the Bermuda grass plots hidden in faculty for quite a while. Because he's like, this stuff's so aggressive, it might get out. Then what are we going to do? Well, <laughs> I think we're past that point now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, his first release was, uh, uh, the, the coastal Bermuda grass, you know, spring system. You know, his last one was Tifton 85. Tifton 85. It's actually a double hybrid. So nobody, he released like 60 Bermuda grasses, but people only remember the first one and the last one. I guess that's the way your career is going to be. That's a pretty good way to go. If we look at forage uh, quality, Cool seasons have higher forage quality than warm seasons. Annuals will have higher forage quality than perennials. So a warm season annual will have a higher forage quality than a warm season perennial. Cool season annual, higher forage quality than a cool season perennial. So you can kind of see where a lot of things fall. Kind of the odd deal out of that is legumes are kind of a class of their own, especially if we're talking about alfalfa or some of the red clover. This just show, goes to show, if you take like an eight-week stage Bermuda or four-week there, you can look at the crude protein levels. Tall fescue and vegetated boot stage is 12 to 16% crude protein compared to Bermuda, eight weeks is 6 to 8% crude protein. So you can kind of see the differences in some of those forages. Ryegrass, uh, very high-quality forage grass. Uh, you know, if we could grow perennial ryegrass here consistently, that would be great. But uh, I think annual is the best we'll ever do with, with ryegrass. Maybe people grow ryegrass. You know, just plant some sometime. I don't know if there's a field in the state of Oklahoma that doesn't have some ryegrass <laughs> in the sun. Yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> Cattleman's dream, yeah. a wheat farmer's nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and, uh, you know, most of our, uh, this is kind of how some of these fall into acid or low fertility soils, uh, how tall fescue or like, say, annual ryegrass or small grains fit in, some of those. Uh, one relationship that's pretty much we tell everybody for a rule of thumb, especially with our cool seasons, uh, especially like, say, with tall fescue, it's pretty much a linear relationship for every, uh, 60 pounds of hand you put on her, you'll get a ton of production. So if we got, if you've got an acre of tall fescue here, it's unfertilized and it's a decent pasture, you can expect, expect one ton of production and no fertility. Add another 60 pounds in, bump it up another ton on production. And that's pretty much a linear relationship. We see the same thing with Bermuda grass, it's about 50 pounds. So, uh, so those are kind of some 
kind of rule back of the envelope kind of things that you kind of keep in your mind sometimes on fertility. Uh, we had a lot of people this year concerned about carrying capacity and cost of fertility. And so we, you know, I sit down with a lot of folks and we, you know, figured out their carrying capacities. And some folks had only for, fertilized their best ground. Some folks were fertilizing ground and, you know, had a lot of extra forage that they were not utilizing. So we were able to shave some dollars off here and there. But those are kind of, that's a relationship you can kind of keep in the back of your mind on production of some of these cool seasons. So what can we grow around here? Well, none if it doesn't rain, which sometimes is pretty common <laughs> around here. But uh, on our small grains, of course, wheat, uh, cereal, rye, uh, pretty much rye anymore. Used to work with a lot of some people down on the Red River and the Sandy areas that had rye and then up at uh, Ames, Oklahoma. It's kind of like the little rye capital of the Oklahoma there, they grew a lot of rye there. Poor man's wheat, uh, what it used to be called. But we'll talk a little bit about triticale, and we'll talk a little bit about oats. Uh, we'll talk about annual ryegrass today, but we'll jump into the perennials like tall fescue, and we'll talk a little bit about some legumes that'll work in this area. Uh, triticale, cross between wheat and rye. Has anybody planted any triticale here? It's going to get the forage quality of wheat and the winter hardiness of rye all in one package. Uh, the problem with triticale is it's a fairly new hybrid. Really hasn't been around all that long compared to a lot of other things, but it's still kind of finicky. And the reason sometimes uh, the seed production is unstable with triticale. So some years there's a lot of triticale seed on the market for people that they want to plant triticale. Some years you can't find a bag if you want to. And that's the reason why it's kind of a crack sheet on how the seed harvest is going to be on triticale. Uh, it's very high in forage quality. Uh, it will outproduce wheat all day long on sandy soils. So it's really that really works well on sandy soils. Uh, when fall planted, it can produce quite a bit of forage, uh, produce up to 80% of its yield sometimes by winter, depending on what you're looking at there. So. Some of the varieties you'll see in this area uh, is the NF201 that came out of Noble's program about, about five years ago. Uh, Tri-Cal 348 you'll see in this area. Uh, that's a lot of work burn, done at Burning, Texas on that particular one, and then Slick Trick. But what everybody's going to now is what you're seeing is uh, Triticale is known to have probably half inch to a three quarter inch on, which makes it kind of tough for grazing animals. So now you're starting to see a lot of the beardless types come out from grazing animals. Look at oats. Uh, I'm a fan of oats. I think it's one of the most underutilized forages that is out there. Uh, most of the oats you get in this area are what we call facultative. That means you can plant them in the fall or spring. Uh, when I was at Noble, we planted oats probably for about 10 years and only lost them to winter kill once. Uh, we've always averaged about 10 to 15 percent stand loss on average for the month, but we never completely lost the stand. If you want emergency forage and you can get these oats in the ground, say mid to late February, you will have all the forage you want. They are one of the best versatile forages for emergency forage that you can get. Uh, everything likes oats. Uh, you can do oat hay, whatever. Just, things will find it. I mean, it, oats is very palatable. Uh, like I said, most of them can be planted fall and spring. Again, if you plant it in the fall, you can get a lot of production of early. I've seen some producers plant it in the fall, uh, utilize it right up till winter, and they lose some of the stand and come in and drill more oats over oats over oats kind of in late February and almost get a double crop out of it. Some of the varieties you'll see here, NF402, heavy grazer two is probably one of the best oats I have seen in 25 years. East Texas seed at uh, Tyler, Texas has that. Uh, if you're ever interested in getting any seed, you almost have to tell them a year in advance. That's 
I mean, people get ready to buy that stuff out quickly. Okay, oats, you can get through the uh, foundation sea, so the still water. And then TAM 411, that's a new Texas A&M product I'm not too familiar with, but it's showing up a little bit in our fields. Uh, but most of these oats are very, very good, and they've all been bred for grazing purposes. So, so when it comes to small grains, I know a lot of weeds come out every year more than I can keep track of. Uh, cereal rye, boy, it's hit or miss on rye anymore. So I, I know a few people that might plant it, but I think those numbers are kind of going down. But the oats, I'm starting to see a lot more of. And I'm starting to see a lot more of the triticale, if you can get triticale seed. If you're looking to get triticale seed, the best place I can tell you is probably Johnston seed. Up in the they usually have some, some triticale seed, but the varieties may be kind of back and forth what they can get. Uh, looking at this, if we look at these growth curves, one thing I get is about plant mixtures. You know, what if I plant wheat and rye? You know, I get a lot of this now, especially with the cover cropping. Uh, I'll put these growth curves up here. So here's all our small grains with annual ryegrass. Uh, you can see rye, cereal rye is our earliest producing small grain we have. And when you do mixtures, I tell people to look at these growth curves, where they fall in. So like a good mixture there would be cereal rye and annual ryegrass. We're losing that production of ryegrass early in uh, annual, or cereal rye early in the spring, but we're getting boosted because here comes the annual ryegrass. So we're covering that little bit of forage gap. Uh, oats work well with rye. If you're gonna probably do mixtures, they're almost looking at planting rye, probably with another one, just because rye comes on early, then we come on with something later in the year. So, but cereal rye and annual rye grass, a couple of producers I work with, they like to plant cereal rye. They'll be running that through their big drill box and on the back, they'll fill it small seed box of annual ryegrass and they just pull the tubes out and they'll just dribble that annual ryegrass on the ground behind that cereal rye. They'll dribble it on there in about 10 pounds, 15 pounds to the acre. And you don't really see it until about March. And then it just, you know, rye, cereal rye is kind of tapered off. Here's, here comes all this annual ryegrass. And it will be, uh, you'll get a tremendous amount of production in like 60 days. And I tell producers, you really need to be ready for it because it will come on and all of a sudden you got more grass than you do livestock. Uh, this is one of the issues with ryegrass putting it over Bermuda is because we can actually shade our Bermuda production. Start Our Bermuda starting to green up right here. If we got too much annual ryegrass out there, we can actually hurt that production shade. That's a little bit sad. So we have to be careful sometimes cropping with annual ryegrass. But uh, probably golf and Marshall ryegrass is two most common annual ryegrasses you'll see around. So talk about cool season perennials. Uh, love it or hate it, tall fescues in. That's for a cool season perennial in the state of Oklahoma. That's that's it. Uh, like I said, I spent 20 years at Noble, and one of the things they tasked me when I started there was to try to find a cool season perennial option for producers, especially west of I-35, that they could grow and not have to rely on planting the winter annual every year. <coughs> and uh, we looked at, I mean, you can grow some tall wheatgrass, but the forage quality is not that great. A uh, few other things out there, but tall fescue is one of the things that really we really looked hard at. But tall fescue has some issues, and we'll talk a little bit about that. It's adapted to a lot of different soils. It can grow in a pH of about 5.2 up to about 7.8. Uh, works well in year-round grazing systems. You can grow legumes in it. Like I said, you can produce a ton of forage without any fertility. 
and uh, it's pretty adapted to a lot of everything. It's the only place I tell producers to avoid that they won't tolerate this is the sugar sand. It will not tolerate very heavy, very heavy sand. So if you got sugar blow sand on an area, don't plant tall fescues because it, it will not make it over a year. We look at the forage distribution. See, we get a lot of production in April and June, typical cool season curve. Production in the fall, we would plant tall fescue around here about September 15th to about October 15th. You can stockpile it over the winter. It makes really good stockpile. So it's the same as you would stockpile Bermuda, just the opposite season. And get some standing hay grazing through uh, the wintertime. It doesn't collapse very easy, so it, it, it hangs on pretty good. So what's the difference? Uh, a couple of things you'll see now, if we look at tall fescue, they're summer active and they're summer dormant. Some folks would call it continental or Mediterranean. Uh, the continental, the best I can give you, that's Kentucky 31. If y'all familiar with Kentucky 31 tall fescue, it originated from Europe. It came over here. You can trace every bit of the tall fescue in this country to one hillside in Kentucky. There's a monument there. You can actually go see the monuments on the William Sutter farm. He was the only one known to have green grass in the wintertime. Time they didn't know what it was, it was tall fescue. They're not, he bought that farm in early 1800s, late 1700s, somewhere in there. The only thing they could figure if that grass got there was that it came from Europe by some of the immigrant ladies. They packed their dishes with crop fodder in boxes to keep them from breaking on a voyage over the ocean, and that's how the seed got spread. So, but it all originated on one hillside. So every bit of the Kentucky 31 you see in this country came originally from that hillside. Uh, so that's the old Kentucky 31. There's also some new things and something I worked on is the Mediterranean or summer dormant. Some of y'all may have heard it called the Chisholm Tall Fescue. And it actually comes from the Mediterranean region, the Atlas Mountains. So we're talking Morocco and Tunisia. It actually probably should be its own species of grass. They're very different. And it doesn't have any of the livestock problem that you would hear with Kentucky 31. If we look at tall fescue and we talk about continental versus Mediterranean, you can see this is, we can pretend you can pretty much divide Oklahoma in half with I-35. Everything to the east, all the way to the eastern seaboard and up is where you would grow continental type tall fescues or Kentucky 31, could be Jessup Max Q, could be Texoma Max Q. But that's pretty much that area with that dark shading as the area where it really, really grows a lot. Now that green area is where we targeted uh, this Mediterranean material. And basically it's, you can look at rainfall too. You know, rainfall at Altus compared to rainfall at Idabel. So vast difference. Uh, but we're talking about pushing tall fescue out areas now where we, you might only get 14 inches of rainfall per year. Kentucky 31 would only grow for about a year, maybe in the lot area, unless it's in a creek bottom. But the new Mediterranean summer dormant type uh, does quite well in these areas. Some of the things you'll see with the Kentucky 31, we talk about toxic tall fescue or Kentucky 31 has an endophyte in it. And this endophyte is a fungus that lives inside the plant. And it's a symbiotic relationship. This fungus provides this plant protection from disease, some protection from drought, and also some protection from herbivory. That's insect herbivory, but it's also livestock. So where I'm at in the eastern part of Oklahoma, a lot of tall fescue, and it's a lot of Kentucky 31, been there for generations. And a producer will say, well, my cattle will gain weight on it. And he's absolutely right. They'll gain a pound and a half a day all day long. We've got 70 years of data that backs that up. But if you put in one of the newer types that has the fungus that doesn't have the livestock toxicity, then those animals are going to gain three pounds. But producers miss a lot of that because most producers don't have the ability to weight animals on their farm. 
so they don't see them. Actually, what those animals are after doing, they're actually regulating themselves on that toxic tall fescue. There's certain times of year they don't like to eat it, and when they do, it causes some issues like vasoconstriction, which causes them to heat up in the body, and that's why you see them standing out in the ponds up to the neck trying to cool off in the summer. So there are some issues. Big folks in Missouri, Arkansas have a lot of issues with this. But one of the ways around it was to put in a friendly endophyte or a friendly fungus, provides the plant the, everything it wants, except doesn't produce the ergot alkaloid, which is toxic to the live, livestock. There was a time we went to endophyte free where we could just take the fungus out of the plant. We figured out how to do that pretty easily. But we found out it also kind of Damage the persistence of that plant material. But we also figured out we could put a friendly fungus in it too, give that persistence back, and then take away that livestock toxicity. So if you see like an ad for Jessup Max Q, that's a friendly tall fescue, it's a continental type, and that Max Q stands for the friendly fungus. Uh, some folks call it Protec. Barenberg has a product. They call it E34. All it is is a type of tall fescue. They've just taken the toxic fungus out to the trail. So a lot of the folks east of 35 had a lot of issues with this. <clears throat> this is the, uh, the squiggly line here. That's the fungus. It grows in between the cell walls of the plant. So it lives in the grass plant. It's only transmitted in the seed from generation to generation. It can't jump from plant to plant. So it's maternal influence. So you have a toxic plant, it drops seed, that seed's toxic, produces another toxic plant. Uh, you can find it in the leaves, the stems. It's not in the pollen. It doesn't transmit by pollen. It's in the seed. Uh, like I said, we talked about some of the advantage it gives to the plants, but also it can cause some issues to the livestock. So here's a, a plant. You can see the uh, endophyte, kind of the blue, fluorescent blue. Here it is growing up in the seed head of the plant. It's being re getting ready to be transmitted to the next generation. That's why you get a lot of people in the East that have top fescue, they'll top their pastures to avoid those seed heads. Because the highest concentration of that ergot alkaloid is going to be in the seed at that time. So you don't want the animals grazing. Plus, you're trying to break that cycle of toxic seed being dropped. So it's only transmitted from seed to seed. And this is a picture that I had taken. The cattle on the left have been grazing Kentucky 31, toxic. And these cattle on the right had been on, these were actually crossfed. They were on uh, Texoma, Max Q2, tall fescue, you see the difference. You know, so they don't have that rough hair coat, don't have that toxicity in that forage. So this was, these are real good products, but where we're at right in this area here on this I-35 corridor, it's kind of borderline. I could plant this Texoma and this kind of, Depending on our weather right in here, it's kind of finicky. We could go either way. Some years it would be really dry. We could be wet. So this was always a kind of an issue of like, well, I may plant this and it's in for four or five years and then we hit some drought and I lose it. So this is where the Mediterranean tall fescue comes in. Uh, Mediterranean was the only stuff I had that I worked with. And remember the drought of 2011, we all like to forget. Uh, that was the only stuff I had to come through and stands 100%. I mean, I didn't get any grazing out of it that year, but I didn't lose any of it either. And again, it's all based on that rainfall area. It could go western Oklahoma, out in southern California, in those areas. Uh, got great winter growth, but it, it doesn't have any fungus in it at all. It's endophyte free, but it also has the ability to go dormant in the summertime. I'll show you what that looks like. That's its escape mechanism from our dry, hot weather. And basically, if we look at this top bar, we can imagine this was like the Texoma friendly endophyte we just talked about. You can see it tries to grow a little bit in the summertime, 
Not a lot where the summer dormant doesn't grow at all in the summertime. If conditions are right, it will stay what we call dormant. So even though they're fescues, they're both fescues, they actually should be two different species, really. Here's the summer dormant we're fixing to talk about on the left. Here's the summer active. You can see the difference in the two plants. The summer active has a very wide leaf, a little fuller look. The summer dormant's a lot finer leaf. So it's very visually different between the two, even though they're both tall fescues. So this is chisel. This is the only summer dormant tall fescue you, you will see out there. Uh, there's some quite a bit in western Oklahoma, uh, north Texas, all the way out to eastern New Mexico. Uh, this field, I took this picture in uh, early April. This is over at uh, Ringling. And I took that picture at 1st of July on the right. So that's what you can see in that field. That's summer dormant. It goes dormant. You, you know, I've had producers call me and say, Mike, this stuff's dead. You know, you go out there and it looks like that. And no, it's live. You can't pull it out of the ground. It just, it goes dormant. And it just really goes to sleep. And it will not green up again until about 15th of September, depending on what kind of rain. Historically, we usually get a decent rain right after Labor Day sometimes. And then it'll get going and growing. Uh, It'll be dormant enough you can actually put glyphosate over the top of it. Some of the you get to get any weeds. You'll get some warm season grasses come up in it when it's dormant, especially some years we get crabgrass or something. Uh, most produ producers just treat it like a double crop, go ahead and graze it. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, endophyte free, has no livestock issues. Horses can eat it, doesn't matter. Now, some people ask me, how does it go dormant? Well, several things. One is photo period. So as the days get longer, as we get into summer, it kind of tells these plants, be ready to go dormant. That's kind of the, it sets the plant up. Then it's a combination of heat and lack of moisture. So as those kind of play in, like as we're getting hot now and starting to get a little dry, if you had some of this stuff, you would start to see it brown out or start to go dormant. Now it's not obligate to go dormant. Uh, I've seen some pastures in 2015 that uh, when Tropical Storm Bill came up through here, we got quite a bit of rain there in June or something. Uh, I've seen some producers that had some of this. They took cattle off. Tropical Storm Bill come through, rained a lot. This stuff, even though it's hot, it greened right back up. They put cattle back on it, ended up taking them off about the 15th of October or 15th of August, and then they were back on it the 20th of September. So, you know, depending on conditions, it can fluctuate a little bit, but uh, very seldom do we get a summer in Oklahoma we get enough rain, you know, mid June through July, early August, that this stuff's going to stay actively green. So it does go through a dormant period. But that's its uh, protection mechanism. It's going to be about the same as the Max Q, except it's going completely dormant. So the Max Q will not go dormant. So if you put, that's kind of the deal with Max Q over here, that the continental types, they don't go dormant. They'll try to grow in the summer. And a lot of times that's what kills them over here, uh, is we just get too hot and dry. Where if I was in Idabel, we may get hot, but I'll probably have some moisture. So it'll probably make it. But uh, the continental types west of 35, it's almost you know certain after a year or two they will die. Well, this stuff, you know, somebody asked me, said, Mike, how long will this last? If I do everything by the book, you know, textbook, do everything, you know, I'm supposed to, how long will it last? Well, there's no reason it shouldn't last 20 plus years. Then I've had them ask me, well, what if I do everything wrong? I was like, well, it might be gone in five or six. And they're like, well, it's five or six. I didn't have to plant weed. So it reseed itself? You'll get some reseeding ability. I'd say about 15 to 20% kind of recruitment of new seedlings. Uh, but I wouldn't rely on it to, you know, just completely reseed. A lot of our perennial plants just don't do that very well. 
uh, <clears throat> you know, you'd plant this stuff September 15th, October 15th, about 15 to 20 pounds to the acre. Uh, the big thing with, uh, you know, a lot of folks on no-till, I'm a big fan of no-till, you know, especially if you're coming out of graze out wheat. The big thing is, is to hit that, uh, you know, graze that wheat out, maybe put a light spray of glyphosate, clean up anything that's still out there, then maybe spray it again early fall. Once you get a, to get a little bit of rain, you get a flush and say some ryegrass and some things, go ahead and spray that and then plant into it. Your biggest competitor for this, you know, the biggest day of any pasture you plant is the day you plant. I mean, so if you've got everything prepared, you know, and everything ready, you should have a success. But the biggest issue I see a lot of times is I'll go out and there'll be a, a lot of ryegrass in the field. There's too much competition. That's the biggest competition you'll have with these fescue seedlings when it's starting is ryegrass. So if you can kind of clean the ryegrass out. Uh, but it kind of does take kind of two sprays there, sometimes one, it depends on the field. But like I said, most fields in this country has a progress. In it somewhere, so. But this is a three-year-old stand. That's over by uh, Dixon. This is some work I was involved in uh, with Chisholm compared to uh, graze out wheat. Uh, if you look, you get about an average return of about $135 per acre compared to about 102 on wheat. You won't see that the first year. Being a perennial, any perennial you plant, that first year is almost total establishment. So you're letting those roots establish, those plants get going. And so you'll get very, very limited grazing that first year. Then you can implement your grazing program the second year. That's when you start seeing that return because you're not having to put the money into plant the winter and the winter. So that does come back to you. Weight gains are very similar to wheat. We're running about two pounds a day on the fescue compared to about 2.1 on the graze out wheat. Does very well for hay. This field was over at Faxon. Uh, the producer cut it about two days after this photo. So you can see it's pretty much headed out. I went back out and cored some hay off these this field. You can kind of see the samples up there. Protein was pretty good for it being very mature stand. Uh, relative feed values were very high, had very good digestibility, pretty good energy there. So a uh, few producers are using this just as a hay program. So. I'll just hit on a few things on legumes here. Uh, slip over to this one. Uh, a lot of stuff comes into the office about legumes and synthetic fertilizer replacement of N. Yes, they do fix N. It's great for doing that, but they're not a free fertilizer option either. So you, they do rely on phosphorus and potassium if you look to put legumes in your pasture. Uh, this is some alfalfa plants here. Uh, one on the left is phosphorus starved, and one on the right is potassium starved. So, uh, most of our legumes mine phosphorus and they mine potassium very heavily out of soil. They can remove up to, an alfalfa crop can remove up to 60 to 100 pounds of potassium every cutting per acre from the soil. So that hay leaves the field and so does that fertility. Uh, so that's one thing we need to think about. Uh, a lot of producers are interested in putting legumes in pastures. That's great. Uh, you do, we'll see some end benefits, but Need to think about P and K as well. Uh, the other thing is inoculating the seed. That seed on the left is naked seed. It doesn't have any coating at all. Well, the seed on the right is coated. That's coated with a product uh, that's called rhizobium. Basically, that's a bacteria. That is the bacteria that infects the roots of the legume. That's what fixes the nitrogen to give you your free nitrogen. Uh, there's probably not much naked seed sold in these legumes on the market. A lot of it's coated anymore. But if you grow red clover, 
then there's a specific bacteria for red clover. If you grow alfalfa, there's a specific alfalfa bacteria for those roots. So same way with hairy vetch. Uh, so these need to be inoculated. Some producers will say, well, you know, I've planted alfalfa here before, red clover, so I, I'm good. Yeah, there's probably still some of that bacteria in the soil, but I would go ahead and re-inoculate the seed. Uh, like I said, there's proper rhizobium for each species, and this is the, it's important because that's the bacteria you want to get that free in from. That's what the nodule, if you ever dig up a red clover or white clover plant or alfalfa, that's, you see these little bumps on the roots? That's the nodules that the bacteria <coughs> lives in, and that's what fixes your end in the soil. That's what it takes uh, nitrous oxide from the atmosphere and reconverts it into a form that the plants can actually use in the soil. So that's why it's important to get that proper bacteria. And you know, you can order, get these bags sometimes at co op, you can order them online. They'll run anywhere from five to twenty dollars per bag. And like this is this nitrogen seed, this is what does alfalfa. It's just a black powder. That'll do 25 to 50 bushels of seed, just that one little bag. It costs about 10 bucks, maybe at the most. So it's a real cheap input compared to what you're wanting to get to do so you know i always you know really uh look for people to inoculate this if you buy some of this it does have an expiration date on it you can put it in your ice box uh you know it might have an expiration date for a year or two don't freeze it just stick it in your ice box hide it in the back of your wife don't see it use it or something but uh anyway it's just a black fungus powder you can actually inoculate naked seed with this. You just need to pour it in the seed with a little sweet milk, stir it around, it'll stick to it, and let it feed for you. Uh, so how much nitrogen can you get? You can get 50 to 300 pounds per acre of free nitrogen, depends on the legume. And most of the end is in the leaves and the stems. That's what's converted back to protein for your animals. Uh, most consumed by the animals, some's recycled in urine and manure, uh, and it gets this from the root stems and leaves over time. And so you'll get some that decay and nitrify, so you get some plants that die, and then that nitrogen goes back into the soil as well. But this is the last slide I'll show you. That uh, so you can see the seed cost of these various legumes here. How much nitrogen they can fix, and then the value of that over time. Uh, you know, you can kind of start to put a pencil to this. Air leaf clover, you know, anywhere along 81 Highway, you can grow air leaf clover. Uh, seed cost, you know, we're probably looking around $20 to acres to put in air leaf clover. You can get anywhere from 50 to 150 pounds of free in air leaf clover. Uh, hairy veg, uh, it's getting to be pretty popular. It's about the same. Seed cost a little bit more. That'll probably come down soon. Uh, alfalfa, it's a really good nitrogen fixer. You should see about five or six new varieties in the next five years come out for this area. Um, there's an article in uh, I Am Forage magazine in the last couple of two or three months about uh, overseeding alfalfa in the Bermuda. Mm -hmm. uh, have you seen that done? Yeah. Is that no problem? Yeah, so I, I'm a big fan of that. It done, me and, uh, I've done a lot of work. I'm doing some work now uh, with that. So with Bermuda grass, Bermuda grass is you know our warm season base and it's great forage, but if you really look at it from a forage quality standpoint, it's not that great. I mean, you know, you're running about 9% crude protein on average most of the time. One reason, two reasons to put alfalfa in, well, three. One is free nitrogen. The second is you're improving that forage quality, that stand. Now you're mixing that legume. You can bump that up, you know, depending on the density of that legume in the 
For bluegrass, now you can have a pasture that's 14, 15 percent crude protein on average. And then the third thing is, especially what you want to watch with alfalfa in this area is the fall dormancy. So if I'm going to grow alfalfa in this area, I'm going to probably grow a fall dormancy of anywhere from seven to nine. And basically, the higher the fall dormancy, the more the alfalfa will grow. So if I was in Southern California, say on the Mexico border in the Imperial Valley, they do some alfalfa production here. I'm going to plant a fall dormancy 11. Basically, that means it never stops growing. I can cut it 12 months out of here. We're here seven or nine. We're going to get alfalfa production from about April through the end of November. So as that Bermuda grass tapers off in the fall, that alfalfa production is creeping up. I can, especially if I got a stalker program, I can push it way out to that weeds ready to go. I can hold them over on that. So that that's a value you're covering that forage gap to your wheat. If you got adequate growth on your wheat to go to that winter annual, or if you got a pest you can go to it. But uh, so the problem with the alfalfa in this area in North Texas is where's most of the alfalfa come from? From a lot of the states up north, they're really geared to dairy programs and they don't have the disease package for this area. So you bring an alfalfa in this area, uh, we have a lot of root diseases. So you might plant alfalfa and it's gone a couple of years. Well, alfalfa seed's not cheap. So, you know, a lot of producers will be like, well, I'm not going to do that. But some of the newer ones start to come out bred in these areas, Oklahoma, North Texas, uh, and New Mexico, and they're very adaptive. Uh, the way to do that is I'm going to plant it, is I'm going to graze that Bermuda stand pretty hard. I'm going to try to, you know, knock it down pretty good going into the fall where I have maybe about four inches of stubble. Uh, if I got a little bit more than that, I'll probably Go ahead and put a what I call chemical frost on it, which is a light rated glyphosate, kind of stop it from growing. That way, I want to go in there in mid September. Uh, if you got a no till drill, that's great. Just go ahead and drill into that Bermuda grass stand at around you know, six to 10 pounds to the acre. And uh, that way, your Bermuda grass is kind of stop growing. The alfalfa seedlings can come up without any competition. Get established over the winter and early spring. The Bermuda grass starts to grow back late spring. The alfalfa seedlings are already about this tall and ready to go. So, but you said six to ten pounds of alfalfa. So yeah, alfalfa. To, to the eight. Yeah. If you're grazing that, how much of that P and K are you recycling? I'd say you're recycling probably seventy-five percent. You'll get some P and K that leaves with your animals when they leave the thing. But the majority of P and K is readily recycled. The alfalfa will take up a tremendous amount of phosphorus and potassium from that tail. That's returned back said about 75% of it in the moon. I think they said they were planted in like 14 inch rows. Is that what you did? Yeah, well, I've seen it anywhere. I'd say, you know, like, I don't know if it's I don't know really got, got any data to show you that says, you know, 12 inch row is better than 14 and this or that. Uh, but probably, you know, 14 would be adequate. Uh, I've seen it done on seven inch spaces. So, I mean, not every alfalfa seed that hits ground is going to germinate. But, uh, but it's, I'm a big fan of alfalfa. Uh, and, you know, there's, there's a reason they call it queen of forages. It's, it's very versatile. And I think I, you're just now kind of reading about that. It's something that I've been trying to push for many years. Uh, and I think you'll see a lot from like Florida Panhandle all the way through here to Eastern New Mexico. People are going to start looking at using alfalfa and they want to see stands. Now, one thing we're also seeing is the yellow flowered falcata types, which you don't see much of alfalfa. I mean, they're hard, hard to find. Those work very well in native grass. That's, that's kind of new. In a couple of years, we'll start hearing more about it. But the key is to get seven to nine dormancy, fall dormancy on the alfalfa.
probably the one you get right now is Bulldog 805. Uh, the other option is if you want to buy a Roundup Ready product, it's Alpha Bay 600. So one advantage to that is, you know, a couple of years down the road, if you want to spray it for weeds and the Bermuda grass is dormant, the alfalfa is still kicking, you can spray it on the top and turn it up and not turn the alfalfa. You're looking at the difference between a $250 bag for the Roundup Ready compared to you know, a $90 to $100 bag for so you didn't yet figure that cost. Those trait, you know, those tech traits like Roundup Ready, you know, when they deregulated Roundup Ready alfalfa, it cost Monsanto and Forage Genetics $14.9 million. So when you go buy a bag of alpha gray 600 is pretty pricey because I'm going to get that back somehow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, we can we we can make Roundup ready anything, but you got to look at what the return is. Alfalfa is about the only forage we got if we do Roundup ready. Still out, we'll get all your figures. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but yeah, that's getting to be a popular thing, and I think with the cost of synthetic fertilizer and uncertainty in those markets over time. Uh, You'll start to see some people really look at you know that kind of option. Uh, what I what I see in that kind of deal, you know, if you can get five to seven years out of that alfalfa and that blue grass, I think you know, uh, there'll be a point there when you probably have to like frost it again and go back over. Again. That's that's kind of some of the newer things you'll see in this kind of I 35 corridor for forage that folks are doing. Yeah. 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 Our potassium, you had a question uh, from one of the county educators the other day. So Mike said, uh, you know, a producer come in, they run a pretty heavy. Bermuda grass haying program. Uh, they might come in with a five, say a five ton yield go, get a soil sample reverse, and you know, they put all the nitrogen on. You know, their neighbor maybe did the same thing, but they put on some potassium or something. They seen a lot more response than I did, but it says my soil potassium is sufficient. What's the deal? Well, you kind of need to, you know, look at that from the point of Say you had a five ton yield go, we say put on X amount of nitrogen and your P and K is 75% sufficient. So you'll get some production, but in reality, let's say your phosphorus was 100%, but your potassium was 75%, but it's still sufficient on the soil table. That potassium is still limited in fact, because it's not 100%, not everything's 100%. So that's the same as taking, you know, that five tons times of that 75%, now I'm only got it like three and a half, three to three quarter yield time. Does that make sense? So you've got that disadvantage of things. So, you know, the fertility on some of these things, the legumes kind of take the guesswork out of some of that, I guess, because you get, uh, you're adding to that fertility budget. So if you do legumes, you know, we usually suggest for people to sample pastures every two to three years, hay, hay fields every year. Uh, always sample with your legumes. See what that P and K is. It may be pretty good. You know, you got some credit there, you know, so you may have to apply some, but really know what you need to apply. Because uh, depending on your field conditions, your plants may use a lot. They may, they may not, just depend on what's going on. But you can always save yourself some dollars on P and K by just saying. So, you know, don't quit sampling just because you got some humans out there. You know, you know, continue because, you know, you may have to put a little potassium, may have to put a little phosphorus, you may not need anything. But at least you kind of know what your fertilizer fertility budget is. Because we can put all the nitrogen in the world out there, but if P and K is not correct, that limits the effectiveness of that plant to utilize that nitrogen. You kind of have to watch the Same way with P and A, pH. 
If your pH is below 5.8, 5.5, you gotta fix that for you to grow any of them. Because they just, they just won't tolerate that. They need to be up around 5, 8. Uh, and it's doable. Uh, you know, you can grow them in 5, 5, but you just need to walk, keep an eye on them. But I wouldn't get down in the low fives or anything. Uh, they're just very sensitive to that. The other thing is with pH, if you get below 5.5, five, you start getting into 5.2, five, 5.1, five, that causes phosphorus in the soil to bind real hard to the soil molecules. You can have all the phosphorus in the world in that soil and plant it, but they use it. You just can't pull it away from the soil molecule. Phosphorus doesn't move in the soil, that stays where you put it, so it doesn't leach more. But if the pH is really acidic, yeah, you can sling phosphorus all day long. I don't think there's big difference up to it. You know, it's, just, it's just not usable. So, kind of have to watch that. But uh, yeah, alfalfa is probably more can tolerate some mid fives. But uh, you start getting five one, five two, you might think about doing some lines. Uh, 